Should you buy Avatar Frontiers of Pandora? Well, that is the question that I'm confident that you'll be able to answer for yourself by the end of this video, as I'm going to take you through everything we know about the game so far, including exclusive info and new details that I've picked up from the developers in person, which is all thanks to Ubisoft, who flew me out to their two preview events for Avatar in Sweden and Los Angeles, so I can make this big boy one-stop shop video for you. And let's swiftly go through some general overview info about this game, so we're all up to date and on the same page. Firstly, it's a single player open world game with the option to play through and reach 100% completion in co-op mode with your mate. If you do have any friends, by the way. <laughs> I actually asked Drew Rencher, the associate game director, about how this specifically works, and he said that after you finish the prologue introduction quest, you'll be able to join the same session with your friend in the menus, even if you're on different consoles or PC. So crossplay is active here in this game, which is great news in my opinion. However, important to note about co-op is you both need to be at the same point in the story to progress. So that's on the same mission, basically, because if you're not, only one of you will gain campaign progression. So make sure you check that you're both on the same point or the same quest before you actually start questing the narrative together. Additionally, this game is next-gen only, which means that if you don't have a PS5, Xbox Series X or S, or a solid Master Race PC, you won't be able to play this game. In fact, I believe it's also available on Amazon Luna and Ubisoft Plus for free if you do have that subscription. Now, we don't have the full console specs at the moment, but I have been told firsthand it will run 60 FPS on next-gen consoles, as well as 4K 60 FPS on PC if you're running a bit of a beast of a system and I'll pop up the official PC specs on your screen right now just in case you want to check what you're able to actually crank out of this game. Now as for game size it's going to take up 90 gigabytes on your PC and at the time of recording Ubisoft haven't published the console sizes yet but expect it to be not too far off that 90 gigabytes as this is a big boy Ubisoft open world video game the first one since Far Cry 6 in 2021 but that reminds me you may also be wondering what Will it be buggy on launch? Well, the game has actually officially gone gold, which means that it has been signed off by industry testers, so it's in solid condition before launch. In fact, Ubisoft's latest game, Assassin's Creed Mirage, also went gold before its release in early October. So if you played that game, expect a similar state of quality from Avatar if you do decide to pull the trigger on it. Now, speaking of Assassin's Creed, Ubisoft likes to pop in a lot of different additions for pre-ordering in that game, and Avatar is no different here because there is a lot of different game editions and exclusive content that you need to be aware of, which I'm going to break down very simply for you now. Firstly, we have the standard edition of the game, which is just the base game with no additional extras that at the time of recording is £69, $69 and €79 Euros for my European and American friends. Secondly, we have the gold edition, which is coming in at £94, $109 and €109. Euros. Now for this price, you're going to get the base game a season pass, which includes two DLC story expansions, which I'll also break down for you in detail shortly, as well as a pre-order bonus quest called Familiar Echoes, which is available on launch, and a unique resistant equipment pack, which will allow you to equip this character gear set and RDA weapon in-game. You'll also get the Resistance Banshee cosmetic skin, which does look good to be fair, but when it comes to our third edition, Ubisoft are cranking it up to 11 here, as they've put together the ultimate edition which is coming in at 114 pounds and 129 dollars and euros so a decent amount here now you're going to get everything that we've just discussed in the gold edition but you'll also have access to the sorrento heritage cosmetic pack which includes a gear set a weapon skin and a Banshee or Ikrin skin. But not only that, you're going to pick up the Sorrento Hunter equipment pack, which is another gear set and unique weapon. And additionally, Ubisoft are also throwing in a digital art book in this Ultimate Edition as well. So you're spending an extra £20, Euros or dollars for a few extra in-game skins here, essentially. So you're going to have to decide for yourself if it's actually worth the cost. But it doesn't stop there because if you decide to pre-order one of these three game editions that we've just gone through, you'll actually get an additional Child of the Two World armor pack, which contains one character cosmetic and a premium weapon skin. Now, if you buy or pre-order this game for the PS5, you're also going to pick up an exclusive Arane Warrior pack, which also includes another gear set and weapon skin for free. Now, I always like to air 
on the side of caution when it comes to pre-ordering games. But just know Ubisoft likes to release these pre-order gear bonuses into Ubisoft Connect a few months after release for free to kind of pump that engagement or those engagement figures for shareholders. So do bear that in mind if you're considering pre-ordering just for these gear sets. Now, these additions aside, there was a lot to go through there. I hope you're still with me because Ubisoft are also offering a collector's edition for their Avatar game here, which is coming in at £199 here in the UK and €229 Euros and dollars at the time of recording. Which is insanely expensive. Now, if you do decide to pick up this edition, I believe they're already selling out pretty rapidly at the moment, to be fair. You're going to get the ultimate edition with all of the extras that we just went through, but also this 35 centimeter or 13 inch Navi figurine standing on top of an AMP mech. And having seen this in real life at the massive studios in Sweden, it really does look good, to be fair, as far as a collector's edition model goes, I mean. Now, not only that, but you're going to pick up a 128 page art book from the developers and a resistance filled notebook filled with sketches of wildlife throughout Pandora. There's also this A2 sized AMP blueprint in the box, which looks pretty cool, and a premium steel bookcase that also doesn't look too shabby, to be fair. And to finish this all off, you're going to pick up a authenticity numbered card inside the box, which is a nice touch, and a set of three lithographs, which are very nice printed artwork, essentially. So yeah, it's a chunk of money here for sure, but as far as a kind of a collector's editions goes, it does seem good value for money comparatively to other recent collector's editions like the uh, Hogwarts Legacy fiasco at the start of the year. But again, only you can decide if it's worth your hard earned cash, but at least you know everything that's coming before this game launches. Now, game editions aside, this game is a live service game, which essentially means that there will be consistent updates after launch in the run-up to the two additional story expansions that we'll be releasing in 2024. The first one is called the Skybreaker expansion, which will be coming out in summer next year, so around June or July, I reckon. And the second story pack is called Secrets of the Spires, which we'll be releasing around this time next year, if not sooner, because Ubisoft are planning on releasing Assassin's Creed Red or Japan in this same window so they'll kind of want to avoid a clash on those release dates between those games now both of these expansions will expand the current map and storyline which is a very nice segue onto that topic now because it's very important for you to know that you don't need to have watched any of the avatar films to kind of really understand what's going on in this game even though the whole purpose of of the game's development and design is to live out our own avatar fantasy in Pandora as confirmed to me directly by the associate director, Drew Rencher. In fact, the premise of this new Ubisoft title begins when our character was abducted as a young Na'vi by humans who were running the ambassador program on Pandora, which takes place before the first film and essentially trains us to be anti-Na'vi, kind of learning the human ways. And then that's when this program, this ambassador program is then shut down thanks to Jake Sully in the first film, where our character is then placed into this cryo sleep for 15 years. We're then woken up and we have to learn all about our Na'vi culture that we've missed whilst trying to build favor with the three clans in this game who are suspicious of us because we grew up with humans and learned their ways. So that's the official non-spoiler foundation of this game in terms of storyline, which takes place at the same time as the Way of the Water film, even though there's no water-based creatures in this first game installment, with all regions, biomes, and a lot of new creatures being brand new to the series. And even though James Cameron's Lightstorm studio producers of the Avatar series worked incredibly closely with the massive Ubisoft development team, it's largely a new universe that is still canon. In fact, when I was at the Lightstorm studios in LA, thanks to Ubisoft, Oscar winner John Landau, the producer of the Avatar series, said during an awesome panel interview that the massive team have done such a good job on this game that he will be quote borrowing some of the game's work to then be implemented or go into future films which was awesome to hear so that's just how highly the producers of the avatar films really rate this game he also confirmed that the game will have a lot of film easter eggs in it if you're actually a fan of the franchise but it's important for you to know that this game doesn't repeat the narrative of the films it's its own story it's just based in the same canon world that is pandora so don't worry if you haven't seen the films or watched them in years you won't see jake sully running around this game but he will certainly be mentioned 
by the NPCs. Now, if you are enjoying this breakdown so far, please do leave a very swift like down below. And if you do end up giving this game a go, please consider using the Andy Reloads creator code at Ubisoft's checkout. Do I get a discount for that? That is a great question. And funny enough, you do because you'll actually get one penny or one cent off your purchase, which is absolutely outstanding. But jokes aside, Thanks very much for your support. I genuinely really appreciate it. Now let's move on and break down the three main regions in the game and the three individual clans in each of these regions because they will be tremendously important throughout the narrative and exploration. The first being the King Law Forest, which is home to the Aranahe clan of peaceful weavers who rely on large moth-like creatures called the King Law who produce silk for their artisan crafts. Now the clan itself will also guide us on our first hunt as a tutorial of sorts in the the game as well as assist us in learning how to tame our very own Ikran flying mount as you can see here which was certainly a very fun quest to do when I played it in Sweden. Now this region is heavily influenced by the rainforest as you can kind of see and dense foliage from the Pandora films also plays a huge part here so it's going to be a familiar setting in that regard if you have watched those films and when I played I did find it really challenging to navigate through the forest so if you're hoping for a deep immersive exploration experience here I think it's fair to say that this environment does tick those boxes. Now, Drew Rencher, the associate director, did confirm to me in an interview that you can't initially freely explore the world straight out of the gate, so to speak, meaning we won't be able to travel to our second region called the Upper Plains until we've strengthened our connection with our Ikran, which essentially means progressing the story to a certain point. And as soon as that happens, we will then be able to travel to the north into the Upper Plains region, which is a expansive grassland that is home to the Zeswa clan who live alongside these gigantic beasts called Zakru. Now, earning their trust will allow us to tame and ride dire horses, as you can see here, with this clan being eager for battle, unlike the Aranahe clan in the King Law Forest, which means this region is pretty combat-centric as they raise kites up into the sky as objective points in the game that we can see, so we can kind of head across to them and take down these RDA outposts and human facilities. But if we head west of the Upper Plains, after progressing the story again, we'll enter the Clouded Forest, which is home to the Kamataya clan, who are healers that apparently have a dark secret as to why they hide away in the mists and fog and kind of isolate themselves from the rest of Pandora. Now, as this will be the last region we visit in game, Magnus Jensen, the creative director, didn't want to give away too much info about this clan and the area on the map, as it's quite spoiler heavy, apparently. But it is end game content here and the final region to explore in Pandora. Dora. Now, Magnus also went on to tell me in person that each of these three regions are considerably larger than the entire maps of both the Division games, and he wouldn't specifically specify the exact kilometer per squared on its actual size, but presumably that'll be around approximately, I should say, 60 kilometers squared if we combine those two Division maps, which is absolutely massive, no pun intended. <laughs> And even though I've seen the map in the menus, which unfortunately I can't show you in this video, I can personally confirm that it's a substantial size. So good news for you open world players. Now, I'm just running around here in the forest on this footage that I captured during my playtest, and you'll notice that I keep activating this purple vision that then highlights points of interest around the map, which is called Navi Senses, which is activated by pressing the RB or R1 button on your controller, which you'll have to use a lot in this game to get your bearings as it allows you to reveal the mangrove nectar plant that I was specifically after in this early game quest. But it also reveals main quest objectives, locations, and allows you to track humans and animals, which you will be spamming a lot in this game, certainly early on. There's also two different types of exploration settings in this game that you should be aware of. The one you're looking at now is in guided mode, which means waypoints and map icons will show up on your screen when playing. But there's also an exploration mode where you'll need to figure out everything yourself, which I did try, and it will be quite quite tough to do. You're going to have to take your time, I mean, because this world is very dense, as I mentioned earlier. But that said, and with that in mind, you're not going in completely blind because the map will unfog just like other open world Ubisoft games when exploring. So it shouldn't be too challenging even on this exploration mode when you need to reference it for kind of directions and waypoints. You can also turn off the vast majority of your UI and HUD on the map itself and in game for a full explorative and immersive experience. And I'm glad the devs have added some Something like this for this kind of particular game due to its impressive and vast environment. And I was also really impressed while I'm on the topic of being impressed 
with the music and audio whilst playing this game. I think it's incredibly immersive, and that's because there is absolutely no looping of sound when it comes to the ambience or region that you're in. So each area will sound different depending upon the time of day or that particular region that you're kind of flying through or running through in terms of kind of like whether that's the grassland plains or whether that's through the forest it's going to sound different and appropriate to your setting there's also six hours of music which you can hear in the background that triggers during certain quests just like this one you're watching now and that really contributes to this pandora experience that ubisoft are trying to kind of transport us to this is especially so when combined with the weather systems and progression of night to day as alice rendell the lead narrative realization designer confirmed that npcs understand the state of the world which means their daily duties will change in accordance to the time of day as well as their reactions to you pending your story or side quest progression and i don't think it's going to be on the red dead redemption 2 level but it's certainly a positive here in my opinion which is an excellent segue onto kind of outposts in these regions while you're exploring because these are big industrial factories that are harvesting resources to fuel the war machine in pandora that are heavily guarded by enemies now for all intents and purposes these are your standard open world bandit camps which i'm sure you will be familiar with if you played any sort of ubisoft open world game but the cool thing about these outposts is that when you clear one out the pollution it creates is then diminished and Pandora begins to visibly heal itself and that is then apparent on the map. It kind of shows you on the map, which again, I can't show you, which is annoying. But if you were to then return in person, it would all be sunshine and rainbows essentially, which is then when you will start getting more favorable interactions with the local Navi tribes as your favor or reputation increases with them, which is what Alice was just talking about. You also earn lots of cool loot, extra resources and crafting materials to upgrade your equipment while you're at these outposts and the developers also told me personally that when you reach the max level of 20 in this game and have finished the main storyline hardcore fortresses will spawn throughout the map offering further replayability kind of like the division 2 if you've played that game which makes sense as massive studios also made that game which i did forget to mention earlier <laughs> just in case you weren't aware now i'm also going to discuss combat and stealth in more detail because we're on the topic of outposts here and i will go through it shortly with you but just know that the game rewards you for prioritizing stealth at these outposts as when you clear one and enter a treasure room you will pick up a lot more loot as a reward so do bear that in mind but before i do break down combat mechanics for you i noticed a lot of you asking about this in a previous avatar video i whipped up and that's regarding character customization now the studio haven't shown this to me directly or how it all works but drew wrencher did confirm to me when i asked him about this that at the start of the game you can indeed customize your navi character in a player creator menu where you can then choose to be male or female you can also choose your body type voice pitch and body pitch Paint. Additionally, you can customize your gear, weapons, and outfits through a transmog mechanic in the menu screen, in the infantry menu screen, if I remember correctly, which I did see and try out myself, which means that you can apply cosmetic skins to your Navi character to look a certain way without sacrificing the stats on your current gear choices, as well as customize your Ikran dragon flying companion from its head ornament it wears, which is essentially some sort of dragon hat, as well as its overall color, flying streamers and a riding seat to make you really feel like you're riding a purple Ferrari that has dragon teeth, which is quite cool. Now, they didn't tell me if we could customize our dire horse when we do get it, but I do think this is another good segue to talk more about movement, traversal, and flying from a mechanical standpoint in terms of how it works in this game as it bounces back and forth between first and third person. Now, if I'm being honest, it feels like Far Cry 6 to me here, but with a little bit more freedom in terms of traversal because you can jump, slide, crouch, sprint, and even charge up a double jump to reach platforms you wouldn't think possible. That said, there's nothing here that I would say is kind of groundbreaking or makes me feel like I'm playing the new Assassin's Creed VR Nexus parkour game, for example, because a lot of the areas in the game are designed to be climbable due to the Navi being very agile. So you can kind of just run at anything you can see and just spam your jump button to kind of get yourself up onto it within reason, of course. There's also these plant puzzle games throughout the explorable areas in Pandora where you'll need to manually touch smaller lily pads that cause the main lily to then retract and open up a kind of passageway so you can then move on through and this is also followed by these springboard blue plants that throw you forward 
forward in certain areas so you can reach different platforms that you wouldn't normally be able to reach with your double jump. And if you combine them with these vine lifts that also allow you to traverse vertically in the game by holding X or square on your controllers, you can get yourself up to ledges that you wouldn't have been otherwise been able to do is what I mean. It is quite linear in certain areas like this quest, but you'll just randomly come across some of these vines out in the world, which kind of sets you off on this new hidden passageway, which is quite cool to experience. Now, again, nothing here is incredibly innovative, of course, but I would be lying if I didn't say I enjoyed the springboarding between different platforms and grabbing onto these kind of vine lifts in midair and quick succession to cover a lot of ground as you can see me do here because it is satisfying to play when it all flows together and you feel like you're really flying through the forest at quick speed. Now flying while I'm on that topic in this game is perhaps the biggest highlight for me. I really enjoyed it and it wasn't too hard to master as you navigate left and right with your left analog stick and up and down with your right analog stick. There's also a standard boost system by pressing X on your controller to increase your mount speed for a limited time in the air as you can see me do here where you'll then need to feed your ikran to then replenish this boost bar you can also dive hover and land wherever you want in the game which I really did like well within the restriction of the playtest that I experienced as well as low level flying animations and the wind resistance that comes with this flying ikran where you can visually see it impacting the water on ground well I thought this was a terrific animation a really nice touch adds to all of that lovely immersive stuff so it's a big positive there from me and this is where another cool gameplay mechanic comes into play because you can actually dismount your Ikran at any time during flight in Pandora to then use your weapons to kind of fire at something in midair and then remount by pressing your d-pad controller very enjoyable mechanic you can also shoot the pilots and gunners out of their helicopters if you're accurate enough which I found very satisfying to do as using your weapons while flying is quite challenging and that's another one of the reasons why I did like it so much. It's not just auto assist or auto aim lock on and the guy goes flying into the trees below because the enemies will absolutely nuke you if you just hover stationary in the air whilst firing your arrows at the chopper. So again, very challenging, very positive, good fun. Now, as for the dire horse, it unlocks in the upper plains region and I was locked into the King Law forest region during my playtest. I think I mentioned that earlier and I was unable to subsequently give this a go. But as confirmed to me by the dev team, the dire horses are expendable. So unlike the Ikran, the bond is temporary with these dire horses, which is why I don't think they're customizable in the menus. Kind of like the Horizon Forbidden West mount summon mechanic if you've played that that game where if you just kill your mount it doesn't really matter you can just spawn another one and I think that's the same thing happening here now combat and stealth let me walk you through some stuff that you need to know some highlights here because as briefly mentioned earlier the game does reward you for playing in a stealth focused manner because killing all enemies in an outpost won't actually clear or complete the enemy fortress like the other open world games, Far Cry is an example, as reinforcements will consistently respawn until you actually turn off the power or blow up certain generators within that outpost, which is intentional because bullets, grenades, and arrows are in short supply, and the game will punish you for going too aggressive in open combat as you will get nuked very quickly in this game, as you can see here. Now, even though the game tries to encourage you to play in this sneaky stealth manner, you'd expect some cool stealth takedowns and unfortunately there just isn't any in this game at launch which I did find disappointing if I'm going to be honest with you. In fact when sneaking up on humans you can only perform a punch animation as you can see me do here which is quite funny to see it the first time that you do it as enemies go flying if you time it correctly but yeah this is an area which could be a lot better in my opinion. It does need a little bit of work and I think that hopefully it'll be added in future expansions. Now as for the AMPs or mechs in this game using your hunter sensors you can highlight weak points to do more damage. You can also hack them and override them temporarily so you can then run up to them and perform the only instant stealth kill. I don't even, I'm not sure if it's a stealth kill, but the only instant animation takedown I found in this game, which I enjoyed performing several times over, but they can also be very quickly nuked with your assault rifle, which I found incredibly overpowered as well. But for the most part, this combat system prioritizes range in the first person perspective with limited development from a close quarters standpoint. I'd even go so far as to say that it's almost like an FPS Call of Duty game as there's aim assist built in if you want it, and you can change the combat difficulty of the AI to be more or less challenging. So if you dabble in these kind of FPS games, it's going to feel 
like a familiar experience, especially if you prioritize using an assault rifle. And that's a nice transition onto the weapons that you can actually use in this game. Because to be absolutely clear, there is no melee weapons in Frontiers of Pandora, apart from your fists, which I've just shown you. So everything else is just range-based. And starting with the available Navi weapons, let's go through them here. We have the longbow, which is your standard generic damage-dealing bow. We then have the heavy bow, which is a long-range, high-damage-dealing sniper rifle of sorts, followed by a short bow, which is a kind of SMG equivalent bow. We then have a spear thrower and a staff sling, which throws grenades at an extended range. As for the human weapons, we have the assault rifle, of course, shotgun, RPG, and stun grenades. So quite a variety to choose from here by utilizing that famous Ubisoft weapon wheel. But just like in Far Cry 6 or the Horizon games, actually, you'll need to craft your ammunition for all of them, which can become a little bit of a pain, to be honest with you, if you're clearing an outpost and haven't come prepared. You also can't dual wield weapons, nor can you attack or kill other Na'vi in this game. It's only humans that are our main adversary with various different weapon loadouts for those human enemies. We've also got mech amp suits, which also come in a variety of different variations regarding offensive and defensive weaponry. And of course, the wildlife of Pandora. I nearly forgot that are our additional enemies enemies in this game. But weapons aside, what about level progression, abilities and skills? Well, there is indeed a leveling system in this game with the max level being 20, which I did mention earlier. And I would love to walk you through the skill tree menu in detail, but unfortunately Ubisoft have said no until launch day. That said, I can highlight some key features which I think you'd like to know. Firstly, there are five different skill trees in your skill menu with a specific skill ability or move that is subsequently unlocked after maxing out each tree. An example of this being that ability to pull enemies out of the mech amps, that's actually a skill that you then need to unlock in the combat skill tree. However, as for the five skill trees themselves, the first is the survivor tree that improves your healing abilities, stamina bar and sprinting and damage resistance. So just making you a harder enemy to kill. The second is a warrior tree that enhances combat proficiency and weapon damage. Our third being the hunter skill tree that improves your tracking of animals throughout the game and increases your ability to identify our high quality collectible resources and the materials in the world, which I'll explain next. But for our fourth skill tree, we have the rider pathway, which allows your Ikran to become more involved in the world when you ride it, such as catching a fish while flying close to the water or performing barrel rolls in combat for a temporary offensive boost. And finally, the Maker Tree, which improves your cooking and crafting attributes in the game with Drew Wrencher, the Associate Director, informing me that resource generation and crafting is a very, very important gameplay loop that feeds into everything else in Pandora. And let's talk about that now, because I'm just going to pause this clip and zoom in here for you where I can show you this harvesting system in the game firsthand, which is a core gameplay mechanic that will be impossible to ignore with the name of the game simply being that you'll need to pick plants and fruits with the goal being not to damage them as you do so. Now you do this by rotating your joysticks to find the correct angle and when it comes loose, you'll then need to trigger your RT or R2 button to then successfully pick it off its branch. Now, the rarer the plant that you find in the wild, the more difficult this will be and it will also grant additional bonuses to the fruit or item when you do pick it because you will then need them to craft high quality gear or food and in this example for our first quest we picked it during the day in pristine condition which means I picked it correctly with my controller during the right time of day so if I picked it during the night and not lined up my joysticks these two additional bonuses wouldn't be added to the fruit and we couldn't benefit from those additional bonuses at our crafting bench now if you played Far Cry Primal before this will be a similar mechanic to you as you need to collect a lot of resources from hunting and gathering in this game and even though I was expecting something like this before playing I'm personally I'm not a big fan of these kind of mechanics in open world games as I find it quite tedious and repetitive after a while because what it means is that you have to kind of stop what you're doing if you run out of health pots or food or arrows ammunition and then leave let's say this outpost that you're having a f jolly time with to then manually go and search for all of this stuff out in the world to then come back to it and yeah it's just a personal polite criticism from me it's a big gameplay core cool mechanic here in this game and I'm going to be trying to dodge that as much as possible. But additionally, you can also hunt animals and claim resources such as meat and hides to cook food and craft items in this game. You can do this by utilizing the Na'vi sensors we spoke about earlier to track animals and then fire a well-placed arrow to make a clean kill. Of course, 
if you use a rocket launcher or assault rifle against a deer, you're not then going to be able to pick up a clean hide for crafting. So this follows the same mechanical principle as the plant picking. You need to do it correctly, and then you'll gain better resources with higher bonuses for the crafting bench. Now, after you've got what you need, you'll then need to return to this crafting bench back at the liberated RDA stations that are populated throughout the world to then craft new gear and cooking recipes, which will then produce food that provides you with solid combative buffs and, of course, weapons with modifications to improve those said weapons. But speaking of the mundane, this is another mechanic which you'll be... I just want to be super honest here, that you'll be coming across a lot in this game, and it'll either be good or bad depending upon your own personal gameplay preference, and that's these mini hacking games, which is quite similar to Spider-Man 2 if you've recently played that game, because you'll need to control your L2 and R2 back buttons on your controller at just the right pressure points to get the first circle to line up with the second circle, which will then unlock the terminal. And once you're in, you'll then need to navigate your way through this electronic maze puzzle until it's hacked and opened. Good news though, because you can select autocomplete in the settings menu to skip this whole mechanic, which is a good addition here by the dev team as it can quickly cause some rage quits once they start becoming a little bit more challenging later on in the game. Now there is a photo mode in this game, which is great with the option of transitioning into third person mode for some cool clips if you're an in-game photographer with confirmation that there will be no new game plus option or any sort of future multiplayer formats like The Division in future game installments. So best to think of this game in a similar format to Assassin's Creed Valhalla with the added option of co-op. So that's basically a main narrative story on launch followed by several mini updates and two larger expansions with new stories to be told in 2024. But that said, as this is this live service open world game, expect a lot of armor and gear packs, which just like Assassin's Creed Valhalla will 100% be in this game as I have actually seen the store page myself, but unfortunately can't show it here. So if you're kind of partial to purchasing some additional cosmetic gear packs for your character to show off to your mate while you're in co-op, then certainly expect two fantasy based packs arriving before Christmas just as a heads up. Now with all that said and done, if this game does sound like something that you fancy giving a go, please do consider using that Andy Reloads credit code option next time you're in the Ubisoft store. It helps support me directly as these videos do take a long time to make. I hope you enjoy them. So thanks very much for your support. I do really appreciate it. And also do check out this new avatar video on your screen right now, which if you like this video, you'll probably enjoy that one as well. Big thanks again to Ubisoft, specifically Chris and Sylvia for the invitation to their awesome avatar events in LA and Sweden and Nika for helping me make this video for you. Coffee is definitely on them and thanks very much for stopping by. Hopefully see you in the next one shortly.